is Dr. T.V. Thomas. He is born and raised in Malaysia, and he is based in Canada right now. And he has been, you see, the, uh, the work as a professor and evangelist uh, during 44 years. And now he is the chairperson, very important the role of the Global Diaspora Networks. So here he is, Dr. T.V. Thomas, would you please welcome him? Uh, one of the things uh, God's people around the world are saying, God is good all the time. And let's confess that this morning. I will say God is good, you say all the time. When I say all the time, you say God is good. Okay, God is good? All the time? All the time? God is good. I've, I've added another line to that statement that God is not only good, but God is also great. And if he's not great, he's not good enough. Right? So let's add the second line. God is great all the time. All the time. God is great. We'll combine those two. God is good all the time. All the time. God is great all, all the time. We need to remember that right through the day, right through the week, right through the years of our life of ministry. I want to uh, thank you. I just want to take one moment to introduce Reverend Barnabas Moon, who is going to MC today. Uh, he leads a ministry called Withy International, based in Seoul, Korea. And I want you to know it's one of the few mission agencies uh, that have moved out into other places and emphasized ministry to migrants. Uh, you want to talk to him and others who are here from Korea about Withy International. I want to invite your indulgence to focus and concentrate because I'm going to use many scriptures and I'm not taking enough to get a PowerPoint ready. And so, uh, so we are going to go fast so that I'll keep my time. The Jews took genealogy and ancestry super seriously. They kept extensive uh, genealogies to establish a person's heritage, uh, inheritance, legitimacy, and rights. After the conquest of Canaan, it was important for Israelites to determine a family's place of residence. So in Numbers, 20, uh, Numbers 26, we, we, uh, it, gives a, it requires the occupation of the land was according to tribes, families, and fathers' houses. Let me read, just read uh, Numbers 26, verse 55. But the land shall be divided by lot. They shall receive their inheritance according to the names of the tribes of their fathers. In certain cases, the transfer of property required accurate knowledge of one's pedigree. We all know that certain offices were hereditary, the priesthood and kingship. After the return uh, from Babylon exile, a person had to prove their priestly descent to access their privileges in Israel. In a tribal community like Israel, it was a man's genealogy that gave the person's identification and location. Therefore, it's not surprising then to see the New Testament places great emphasis and importance on the genealogy of Jesus. Let me read just two passages. Paul in Romans 1, verses 3 to 4, says this, concerning his son, who was born of the descendant of David, according to the flesh, who has declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. The writer to the Hebrews in chapter 7, verses 14 to 17, uh, writes these words. For it's evident that our, our Lord was a descendant from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. And this is clearer still, if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who, who has become such not on the basis of the law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. For it is attested of him, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. 
the story of the earthly life of Jesus of Nazareth is related to the Jewish history by a series of genealogies in the gospel. It's very specific in Matthew, Matthew 1, uh, verses 1 to 7. And in Luke, from uh, chapter 3, verses 23 to 38. And it's implicit in Mark's gospel and John's gospel. We need to keep in mind that the genealogies of Jesus in both Matthew and Luke were made from the accessible official public records. They were accessed long before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. The two genealogies of Matthew and Luke are similar, but they are also quite different. Matthew's genealogy of Jesus goes back to Abraham, and Luke's genealogy goes back to Adam. The Gospel of Matthew opens with Christ's family tree. This is quite understandable because Matthew was writing with the Jews in mind. The Jews were his audience. This is why Matthew begins the line of descent with Abraham the patriarch. And Matthew does not trace it back to Adam and Eve as Luke does. Why? Matthew was trying to convince the Jews that this Jesus that is a prophesied Messiah and King and the very son of Abraham. Luke pushes the pedigree of Jesus past David, past Abraham, on to the first man, Adam, who is literally called the Son of God in Luke 3, verse 38. Luke wrote for the Greeks who worshipped human perfection. Luke presents Jesus to be the Son of Man, the perfect man who also is divine. Matthew traces Christ's genealogy through legal and regal lines to his foster father Joseph. Matthew connects Joseph to King David by his son Solomon, born of Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, a Hittite. While Matthew traces the family tree through Joseph, Luke traces the family tree through the line of Mary to David via Solomon's younger brother, Nathan, by the same mother, Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, a Hittite. Both genealogies of Matthew and Luke, though they diverge after David, converge for two generations in Sheatel and Zerubbabel. What is, unique that, what is unique is that Matthew includes women in his genealogy. That's the most amazing thing about Matthew. Matthew includes five women in the genealogy of Jesus. Friends, women did not appear in genealogies. That was not acceptable practice. Women were merely the possession of a father or a husband. A woman had no legal rights. She was regarded not as a person, but more as a thing. This explains why in the regular form of morning prayer, the Jewish man thanked God that he had not been born as a Gentile or a slave or a woman. Regular morning prayer of the average Jew. Matthew went counterculture, cultural, in presenting the genealogy with five women included. The total of five women are included in Jesus' genealogy. Tama, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. What, particularly, what is particularly surprising is these men, these women are included when prominent patriarchs like Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, and Rachel are omitted from the genealogy. 
Matthew contains four women, each with something counting against each of them, except in the case of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Let's look at Tamar. She was a Canaanite. Tamar, a Canaanite, enticed her father-in-law Judah into an incestuous relationship. Rahab, a Canaanite. Uh, Joshua 2, verse 1. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, and two men, as spies secretly from Shittim, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came into the house of a harlot whose name was Rahab and lodged there. Rahab was a Canaanite prostitute in Jericho, who is mentioned uh, in Joshua 2. She saved the spies and joined the Israelites. Perhaps Rahab, the Canaanite, was the great-great-grandmother of David. Thirdly, Ruth, she was a Moabite. Uh, due to severe famine in the land of Judah, a family moves from Judah to Moab. The father, Emmy Melak, the mother, Naomi, took their two sons, moved to Moab just for economic survival. Then Elimelech prematurely dies, and Naomi is stuck with two sons in a foreign land. We read in Ruth uh, chapter 1, verse 4, the two sons took for themselves more might women as wives. The name of the one was Oprah, and the name of the other, Ruth, and they lived there about 10 years. Ruth belonged to an alien and hated people, the Moabites. Ruth was a heathen woman from the land of Moab. She had her origins in incest, if you study Genesis chapter 19. That's why, according to Deuteronomy 23, verse 3, as a Moabite, Ruth was debarred from the congregation of the Lord until the 10th generation. Ruth, the Moabite, became the an ancestor of King David and Jesus. The fourth person, Bathsheba. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and the one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, a Hittite, was seduced by King David. As we saw earlier, Bathsheba may have been a Hittite herself, but definitely she was a wife of a Hittite. So in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24, then David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went into her and lay with her, and she gave birth to a son, and he named him Solomon. Now the Lord loved him. But Sheba was King Solomon's mother. And so Christ was a descendant of Sheba. Now, why are these women included? Why did Matthew want to include the women in the genealogy? Why these colorful personalities in the genealogy? Why couldn't Matthew have been like many evangelicals who like to uh, 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 almost screen history of anything negative, anything blemish, and write about a person with only the positive traits? Friends, I want to tell you, he was writing to the Jews and he wanted the Jews to become global and inclusive. But more importantly, let me tell you, friends, the grace of God took these women and wove their lives into the ancestry of our Lord Jesus. The blood of these women flowed in the veins of Jesus just as the blood of Abraham and David. So several hybridities were in the lineage 
of our Lord Jesus. Friends, the lineage of Jesus is comprised of men and women, adulteresses and prostitutes, heroes and Gentiles, because this is the fulfillment promise of God to Abraham in Genesis 12, verse 3. I'll bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Jesus is the savior of all men and women, regardless of race and culture. That's why Paul in Galatians 3 verse 8 says, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. Again, in Galatians 3.28, Paul concludes, there's neither Jew or Greek, there's neither slave nor free man, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Friends, I want to submit to you, hybridity of races and cultures and languages is not a new phenomenon. Colonialism ex ex expedited the emerging of racial and cultural and linguistic hybrids around the world. And because of massive polycentric migration, speedy global travel, growing transnationalism, rapid globalization, and digital explosion, and other factors, racial, cultural, and linguistic hybridity is becoming a blooming and blossoming reality. What are the implications of Monsieur Day? For Monsieur Day, let me give you four. Christ's Great Commission calls us to reach everyone regardless of origin or identity. Secondly, the inclusion of the four Gentile women in Jesus' genealogy strongly persuades us that hybridity missions is something we must pursue. Thirdly, hybrid people groups will increasingly become an emerging unreached people group around the world. And the big cities of the world already give evidence there's enough numbers for us to pay uh, attention to in prayer and in ministry. Fourthly, the hybridity of races, cultures, and languages is not a new phenomenon, but the missiological focus is still in its infancy. Friends, this morning, let me submit to you. This is precisely why this consultation was convened by the Global Diaspora Network to help the global church to see this hidden people group, see this unreached people group in different societies, the hybrid people group. As GDN, we want to champion the reaching of hybrid people, uh, people groups, to be included in diaspora missiology. And I trust that you, having uh, taken the risk to attend this consultation and going after the presentations you have already received and will be receiving, I hope you go with a new passion, a new heart, to believe God, that God will reach the hybrid hidden peoples in our communities and across the world. So I want you to turn right now and pray that into, by faith, into reality. I want you to turn around to with at least one other person. If you are three in a table, pray with three. Uh, each of you, praying with focus, Lord, help us to reach the hybrid people groups of the world. Help our ministries to have a vision for this. Help our institutions educational training institutions, our mission agencies, our local churches to focus on the hidden hybrid people 
that will continue to grow and grow and grow till Jesus comes. Let's pray.